Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 375th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a couple of papers about alvarosaurids, including a new alvarosaurid. Also a paper on dinosaur color. Ooh. And we have an interview with Joshua and Anne from the Burpee Museum. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Volchimeria. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some patrons for keeping us running. And this week we've got Lucas and Eli, Ben at Jurassic Site B, Wouter, Elvi, JC, the Gray Allosaurus, Anne, Lorosaurus, Argentrinosaurus, and Kalosaurus Rex. Nice. Thank you so much, everybody, for supporting us and being part of our community of dinosaur enthusiasts. We really appreciate you. So jumping into the news, we've got our Alvarosaurid papers. I'm combining two of them because I started doing one and then I realized we needed the other one, too, for background. It's a two for one deal. It is. Yeah, they're actually both written by the same authors, Alexander Averyanov and Alexei Lopatin. They both come up before in various dinosaur papers. The first paper was published in Systematic Paleontology. It's a redescription of Parvi Cursor Remotus. And Parvi Cursor is an alvarosaurid from Mongolia. Alvarosaurids are those small theropods that often only have claws where you'd expect to see arms and hands and claws <laughs> <laughs> sort of way reduced it down. Although in general, they had pretty strong muscle attachment points to those claws. Mm -hmm. They're a very mysterious animal. One of the most famous alvarosaurids, Mononychus, was the same size as a large compi. I would say, Ooh. if you're thinking about the size of alvarosaurids. And Mononychus is sort of an average-sized <laughs> alvarosaurid, so they're very small, like Compsignathus-sized. Parvicursor is the first alvarosaurid from the Kulsan locality in the Gobi Desert, and the Kulsan locality is part of the Bairun Goyat Formation, which is early Maastrichtian, about 72 to 71 million years ago. It's a very specific time range because it's in between some other probably more famous formations. Yeah, usually you don't get it down to within a million years. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty narrow window. The Kulsan locality is located about 100 to 200 miles southwest of the Flaming Cliffs. So that gives you a rough idea. It's really far south and basically in the middle of Mongolia. Chronologically, it's just before the much more famous Nemecta formation, which includes Mononychus and tons of other famous dinosaurs. I was putting together like a list of what's in the Nemecta formation as a quick summary and has so many dinosaurs. I'm like, I'm not you even going to bother. quickly summarize. <laughs> I'll just mention the most famous alvarosaurid. We talk about that formation all the time. Yeah, it's a really good one. It's got a lot of my favorite dinosaurs. Someone asked on Discord recently if we were going to recreate walking with dinosaurs, which formations we would do. And Nemecta formation was like my number two, I think, after... The Hattag Basin. Oh, uh, yeah, those are good. I also said Elliot because I like to see the boundary between the upper and lower and how things changed. And the, the Triassic to Jurassic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I had nothing from the Triassic. I focus very heavily on Cretaceous dinosaurs for sure. Speaking of Cretaceous dinosaurs, like all alvarosaurids are, Parvi Cursor was named in 1996 and the holotype is very small. It's estimated to be about 39 centimeters or 15 inches long and weigh about 160 grams or six ounces. That's so small. It is tiny. That is about half the size of a compi or a mononychus. However, this redescription showed that the parvi cursor holotype was still growing. That happens a fair amount. Yeah, yeah. It can throw a monkey wrench into the phylogeny and figuring out how big dinosaurs were and how they were related and all that kind of stuff yeah. because they change as they grow up, obviously. Yeah, Musaurus. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And there are famous cases of dinosaurs where we think as a juvenile they were one species and as an adult they were another species and then later they get lumped like Tyrannosaurus and Nanotyrannus. That debate's not over. It is not. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to prove any of these things. But in the case of Parvi Cursor, the size estimate of half a compi is probably too small, but we don't know what the more updated, they didn't give a more updated estimate of its size. They just say it was, quote, far from skeletal maturity. Mm. So 
That can mean a lot of things. Yeah, we really don't know. And maybe it got as big as Mononychus, Mononychus. Maybe it got bigger. Maybe it didn't even get close. Because skeletal maturity also has to do with how bones fuse and stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're really far away from how big they ultimately got. Overall, though, even though it's not an adult, Parvi cursor and the holotype is still a very useful find. It includes most of the legs, hips, and vertebrae around the hips, meaning basically the base of the tail and back and sacrum. One foot also has two complete toes, meaning all of the bones of the toe, plus the claws at the ends of the toes. Unfortunately, it was the two smaller toes, so it's got the smaller claws, and maybe they would have been a little bit less functional, so we don't know if it had like a really big claw on its dominant toe, I guess you could call it. The two claw bones that we have are both under five millimeters or a quarter inch long, which is <laughs> obviously very small, although they would have been longer when the dinosaur was alive and the claw bones were covered in keratin. So maybe like the size, I really think of it as the size of a modern bird, like a crow or something. Actually, I just looked it up. Crows weigh more <laughs> than parvikers are probably weighed because they, weigh, they can weigh up to about a pound, at least more than this juvenile one weight i should specify right we're not sure about the adult yeah unfortunately since we only found those legs and the hips and that bit of vertebrae we didn't find any skull or the quote-unquote hands which are really the most exciting parts oh yeah (laughs) what was it doing with those claws yeah and after parvi cursor was described two more alvarosaurids were named from the barun goyat formation There was Parvi Cursor first in 1996, then there was Ceratonychus in 2009, and Linhonychus in 2011. It's a good spot for alvarosaurids. Yeah, although this redescription and some other recent papers have pointed out there are virtually no differences skeletally between Parvi Cursor, Linhonychus, and Ceratonychus. Uh Uh-oh. And since all three lived at the same time and the same place, they could eventually all be synonymized or combined maybe as different species of the same genus. But they didn't do that in this paper. No. they. It was really weird the way they worded it, actually, where it was like, Linhonychus is just like Ceratonychus and also Parvi Cursor. <laughs> <So, laughs> and when you look at the matrix of the characters that they scored, at least in this case, they basically all scored the same, which means every single attribute where it's like, Did it have this bone oriented in this way? Or was it convex or concave on this side of the bone? They were all the same in the factors they looked at. But I think there are some other minor differences possibly. But whether or not those are big enough differences to be outside of individual variation or ontogeny, since we know at least one of them was a juvenile and still growing, remains to be determined. So just for clarity, the naming priority is the one that gets the most dibs is Parvi Cursor Remotus. Because it was named first. Yes, in 96. Then Ceratonychus Oculatus. And then Linhonychus Monodactylus is last. So if any name goes, it's going to start with Linhonychus. They could all end up being Parvi Cursor and then those different species, Oculatus Remotus Monodactylus. Maybe two of them will get synonymized or like it could be any combination of these although it seems like based on this paper and previous papers i don't think all three of them are going to stick around for that much longer we'll see but all is not lost if you like alvarez swords because as i said those two authors also published a new alvarez sword oh they actually published this new alvarez sword a month before they published the revision of parvi cursor Well, they might have written it at the same time. We know the review process sometimes takes a while. Yeah, I'm thinking they were working on this new dinosaur, and to name the new dinosaur, they had to go through and qualify all the differences from the other closely related alvarosaurids, especially from the same formation. And in so doing, they realized, wait a second, these are all very similar. (laughs) And this one's a juvenile, and someone needs to publish on that because very recently someone said it was definitely an adult, and it's not. So this new paper was published in Historical Biology, and again, it's a new alvarosaurid from Mongolia. It's named Kulsan Urus Magnificus. Was it a magnificent find? It does mean magnificent. So Magnificus is Latin for magnificent. They didn't say why they chose it, Mm. but yeah, I guess they find it to be magnificent. 
And then the Kulsan Rus, or Kulsan Urus, depending on how Latin you want it to sound, is after the Kulsan locality that we've been talking about, and Urus, which is a Latinized ancient Greek, as they put it, for tail. Ooh. <laughs> Because you have to Latinize everything. A lot of times that ends up happening. I just think it's funny to say it's Latinized ancient Greek. So in the end, the name means a tale from Kulsan. A magnificent tale indeed. I guess so. It is the second Alvarez sword found from the Kulsan locality in the Gobi Desert. The first one, of course, is Parvi Cursor, which was named in 1996. But again, the Kulsan locality is just a very small subset of the Barun Goyat formation. So... This is also in that 72 to 71 million year old range and likely coexisted with not only Parvi Cursor, but also Ceratonychus and Lindhonychus, unless they were really limited in range (laughs) and they couldn't make it the the small trek over to the Kulsan locality. Kulsanderus is only known from a pretty partial skeleton. They basically have some neck and tail vertebrae, some ribs, shoulder blades, humerus and hip bones so again none of the head or hands but also they're missing the legs and the back vertebrae fortunately for the researchers though the vertebrae and the hips give some really good bones for comparison so they know it's a new dinosaur yeah and the humerus is also a really cool bone although we don't find a lot of humeri from alvarosaurids so even though it's really interesting it's not great for comparing to other genera and deciding whether or not it should be its own new genus so based on those vertebrae and the hips mostly they found that it was clearly different than that parvi cursor ceratonychus linhonychus group so no worries about synonymizing <laughs> later yeah it would have been pretty funny if they published this paper about kulsanurus and then the next month published a paper about how it and three others are all basically the same Aww. thing <laughs> yeah that's why I think, I mean, they almost certainly wrote them at the same time because you can't turn around a paper in one month in yeah. the peer review process. Kulsanurus looks like its close relatives are other Asian alvarosaurids like Mononychus and Shavuya, and not those other ones in the Barun Goyat formation. Basically, all of the features it has are seen in other alvarosaurids, but not in the specific combination that you see them in Kulsanurus. So you know for sure it's an alvarosaur and it's different. Yeah, but it also doesn't have any like special unique features. It's what you would call in your dinosaur of the day a mosaic of features. Mm, I think that's the term you usually use. (laughs) Most of the details are pretty trivial to non-alvarosaurid specialists. Details like different projections from vertebrae and, you know, something's convex on one and concave on the other and things like that. But it does have one really interesting feature, I think, and that's its deltopectoral crest, which is where the pectoral muscle attaches to the humerus. That deltopectoral crest extends nearly to the upper tip of the bone, basically like almost going into the shoulder socket. It's like it's such a long deltopectoral crest. They describe it as extremely long, and it shares that characteristic with Mononychus. The most likely reason that it has this crazy long delta pectoral crest is that it, that gives a lot of surface area for attaching the pectoral chest muscle, just like our pectoral chest muscle, to the upper arm. And in Mononychus, that was interpreted as an adaptation for digging, a really strong attachment for the pectoral muscle. You could really jam. Your, it's like basically you could do a push up really well. You could think of the muscle in that sort of way, which is you could also dig if you had crazy claw hands yeah. pretty effectively. Except we don't know for sure about this one because they didn't find the hands. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I guess it is theoretically possible that it doesn't have claws for hands. Maybe it has normal hands. Seems unlikely, though. <laughs> <laughs> Seems unlikely. Because all of its relatives have crazy weird claw hands. Our next news item is about how dinosaurs probably had some color on their bodies, like their snouts or beaks, their legs, and around the eyes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a paper published in Evolution by Sarah Nicole Davis and Julia Clark, and they were looking at keratinoids. It's this class of mostly yellow, orange, or red-pink fat-soluble pigments, and dinosaurs, well, animals, can get colorful by eating 
food that's rich in carotenoids. Think of like flamingos that turn pink from eating a lot of shrimp. Mm -hmm. And plants are also rich in carotenoids. So different vegetation, flowers, buds, and fruits. Yeah, I know that's how like some birds and stuff get their color is concentrating it from the things they eat. Mm -hmm. But this can fossilize too? No. Well, they don't fossilize as well as melanosomes, melanin. Those are the black and brown pigments. Carotenoids degrade quickly. They break down and they lose their color quality due to light, heat, and oxygen. So they have not yet been found in any vertebrate fossil, though its presence apparently has been suggested in a fossil snake. Hmm. What they did in this study was they analyzed 4,022 modern, extant, non-passerine bird species, as well as turtles and crocodiles, for a total of 4,034 species. So 12 (laughs) non-birds. Yes. And by the way, passerines are known as perching birds or songbirds, and that includes more than half of bird species. So they're only looking at one half of bird species. But they're looking at the non-passerines, so the non-perching ones. Yeah. The the perching ones are like sparrows and blue jays. They're looking at the non-perching ones. They said phylogenetically, passerines are too highly nested, quote, so their coloration states cannot significantly impact this ancestral avian condition. Basically, by focusing on the non-passerines, that gives them more information. Hmm. Because the passerines are all in one little niche of the family tree of dinosaurs. They're just, yeah, it's just too nested, too far. So were they studying these modern birds, some turtles, and crocodiles and trying to infer things about the archosaurs, all the extinct animals from it? Yes, and then they were mostly looking at birds. Yeah, 4,022 out of the 4,034 are birds. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They looked at the iris, face skin, beak, neck skin, legs, the skin and scales, neck integumentary structures like a crop or a waddle or a pouch, on a bird, as well as plumage in birds. And they took into account seasonal color changes. They found that no carotenoid consistent coloration, so no colors from carotenoids, were found in the claws of birds. So it could be that a claw colored may be a derived condition, something that came later. And they also looked at the iris, face skin, neck skin, and leg skin for turtles, and the iris, face skin, neck skin, leg skin, and leg scales for crocodilians. They looked at carotenoids to see if they affected the color of the skin and things other than feathers, because previous studies have found that carotenoid colors in bare skin, quote, can change rapidly, having color quality replenished as quickly as 48 hours after eating carotenoid-rich foods. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really fast. I guess, yeah, since it's not feathers, it doesn't need to grow slowly. Mm -hmm. It can just fill up the skin with color like immediately. That's crazy. Yeah, that it can change so quickly. So this is different from feather colors that can change when there's molting. And that's usually on a semi-annual or annual basis. Mm. And they wanted to test the idea that carotenoid color in skin came before feathers. Ooh, that's a tough one to test. Yeah. They did find that birds were more colorful than previously thought, and not just in the feathers. If you look at living birds, there's combinations of 66 different carotenoid compounds, and they found carotenoids in the feathers of 33% of all major living bird groups in the group of birds that they were studying. So colors from carotenoid in body parts other than feathers is more common than carotenoid in feathers. And that may mean that with feathers, they're modified seasonally or annually or intermittently could be independent of these other integuments. Interestingly, in penguins, there's chemical data found that carotenoids are present in the beak and the bare skin, but not in the yellow feathers. Hmm. But it's found in the legs and face skin and neck skin, for example. So it's getting that yellow pigment from something other than a carotenoid then? Yeah. They also found birds with higher carotenoid diets from plants and invertebrates from eating those were more likely to be colorful than carnivores. And herbivorous birds had bright colors in more places on their bodies than carnivorous or omnivorous birds. Huh. That's kind of surprising. Yeah. I was thinking of the, like, herbivores as trying to hide in the shadows and stuff like that, but they got more color. 
And turtles and birds express carotenoids in the integument. Crocodilians do not. And that could be because their carnivorous diets, the crocodilians just don't have enough carotenoids to color them. Hmm. So dinosaur diets might have affected their coloring as well. If you think about it, there's more rich carotenoid sources with angiosperms. And plants up until the late Jurassic had much lower carotenoid content than angiosperms. So maybe later dinosaurs were more colorful because the foods that they were eating didn't have carotenoid. But then angiosperms started popping up and that did have more carotenoid so that maybe they got more colorful. Gotcha. That kind of throws a monkey wrench in our idea of what if there was a big pink fluffy T-Rex. <laughs> I, you still never know. <laughs> yeah, but it's unlikely, right? Because if if a lot of the animals that are carnivores are less colorful, then that means the T-Rex might have been less colorful than some of the herbivores. This also is just a guide. The diet's more of a guide. It's not a straightforward indicator. Mm. And it's also really hard to categorize animal diets, especially when sometimes animals that eat mostly fruits occasionally also eat vertebrates. Now, in the study, they used phylogenetic methods, and they found a 50% chance of carotenoid consistent expression. So the carotenoid affecting the color in the skins or things other than feathers in the most common recent ancestor of archosaurs. And again, that's that group that includes birds, crocodilians, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. So they found it's a coin toss, <laughs> whether or not the common ancestor used carotenoids to pigment itself. Yes, in the ancestor, yeah, the most recent ancestor. They says there's probably about a 50% chance of the same thing in basal crown birds, but a 0% chance for feathers. So there's no chance that feathers had carotenoids coloring them Yeah, in the early days? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And extinct archosaur skin scales and beaks may have had coloration from carotenoids. So they got one definitive result from it. And it's that feathers weren't colored by carotenoids in the beginning. Yeah, but it might have affected the skin or other parts. So for dinosaurs, they said, quote, in extinct groups, bare skin regions and the rampatheca, a beak covering, especially in species with diets rich in plants, may express these pigments, which are not expected in feathers or feather homologs, end quote. And basically, it's good to look at bird colors outside of the feathers, you know, looking at the beaks and the skins as well as the colors of bird relatives. Yeah, for sure. Especially because a lot of dinosaurs, I mean, from our perspective, <laughs> the animals we care most about, a lot of them didn't have feathers, right? Like we don't think Ornithischians had too many feathers. Yeah. Something like Triceratops, we want to know what color its frill was, or a big Parasaurolophus crest, what color that thing was, or a Stegosaurus plate. Yeah, it's the drawings that came with this, at least in one of the articles, are pretty fun because they kind of highlight where you might see the colors. And there's, for example, a tyrannosaur, and they show coloring around the snout and around the eyes and the legs. And then right next to it is a duck, and you see the coloring in the snout and the <laughs> or the the beak and the feet as well. They're using their modern analogs to get some ideas. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting if T-Rex was like duck colored, had like that nice green head or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then for a ceratopsian, they've got different colorings on like part of the back and the beak around the eyes and on the frill a little bit. Yeah, for sure. That especially the frill and the plates on Stegosaurus really seem like they would be good opportunities for some showy coloration. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they figure out a way to detect at least some method of this carotenoid presence in fossils. Yeah, I want to know which dinosaurs were pink. <laughs> or orange or green or <laughs> yeah blue. but pink just seems like the ultimate not what we think of dinosaurs as right now <laughs> very true <laughs> especially since the big tough dinosaurs potentially could have some pink going mm -hmm. on exactly <laughs> and the modern birds the toughest ones are not pink <laughs> <laughs> speaking of ceratopsians i don't know how good of a segue that is but i'm going for it so <laughs> starting on march 12th Visitors to Melbourne Museum will be able to see Horridus the Triceratops on display. That's the world's most complete Triceratops skeleton. And we've talked about it before, but uh, now there's more details. It's part of the exhibit Triceratops Fate of the Dinosaurs. It's going to take up two stories of that museum, which is pretty cool. That's the one where they, when we visited, they had the Amargosaurus. Oh, that's where they're putting it? 
Well, I don't know where they're putting it. I was just thinking in terms of two floors. Mm -hmm. You could see the Margosaurus from two floors. The first species named Triceratops was Triceratops horridus in 1889 by Marsh. So that explains how it became horridus, the Triceratops. And horridus has 226 bones and weighs more than 2,200 pounds or 1,000 kilograms. In the exhibit, you can learn about Horridus' environment and other dinosaurs that lived around Horridus, as well as the process of fossilization. Cool. Yeah. Sounds like a good display. It does. Wonder if it'll travel back here. <laughs> if we'll ever see our Triceratops again. <laughs> <laughs> In Cathedral City, California, they're getting 11 life-size dinosaur sculptures along Highway 111. And it's part of this new art exhibit called Jurassic Wonders. They'll have it up in the next few weeks, and then it'll be displayed throughout the year. And the photos, I think these dinosaurs are made of metal. Looks like it includes Spinosaurus, Velociraptor, some sort of sauropod, maybe Apatosaurus. The artist Ricardo has been working on these for six to seven months and partnered with the nearby Museum of Ancient Wonders, which has an exhibit right now called Mesozoica, the Age of Dinosaurs. And that includes fossil casts from more than 30 museums around the world, and they've got Fully mounted dinosaurs, skulls, teeth, claws, and eggs. Hmm. I appreciate that they named it Mesozoica. Yeah. Rather than every other thing names it Jurassic something or occasionally Cretaceous. Nobody acknowledges that dinosaurs were around for the whole Mesozoic in their titles. Well, when you have fossil <laughs> casts from over 30 museums, I'm sure that's a lot of different age ranges. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, last, we recently saw a spot, a crossover with Olympic skier Michaela Schifrin, who came face-to-face -face with Blue and Rexy. It looks like Blue and Rexy to me, anyway, from Jurassic World Dominion. I think so. Yeah. And the Winter Olympics in Beijing start February 3rd, so that's why they're doing these crossovers. In this particular ad, she's skiing down a slope, and while she's skiing, we see a velociraptor running alongside her. That's Blue. Then she stops, and Blue comes out, but... Before anything happens, Rexy appears. I don't know why she stops, by the way. Yeah. You're, you're skiing and you see a dinosaur running alongside you, so you stop. I think she just noticed something was amiss. You keep skiing. That's what you do. Well, she skis away after Rexy appears. Smart. This kind of goes with the theme in Dominion that the dinosaurs are out in the wild. Oh, I didn't even, I had no idea what they were going for. I guess that makes sense now. Yeah. That, yeah. We're in that period after Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom when all the dinosaurs are roaming free. Yeah, they could appear anywhere. There's two other ads. We saw another one with figure skater Nathan Chen. And while he's skating, there's a bunch of Parasaurolophus that come up. And they, they just kind of look at him and then run <laughs> away. <laughs> it's sort of like deer in the woods yeah. situation. There's another ad with snowboarder Sean White, but I haven't seen that one. So I'm not sure which dinosaurs he encounters. Yeah, lots of cool stuff around Jurassic World Dominion coming up since we're, what, five months, less than five months away. Yeah. I was just thinking that would have been a good opportunity to have some feathered dinosaurs when you're on like frozen lakes mm. and on ski slopes and stuff. Those are some cold dinosaurs all naked without their feathers. That's true. Well, Especially blue. Maybe the one with <laughs> with Sean White has feathers. Maybe. I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Joshua and Anne from the Burpee Museum. But as always, we have an extended version. So if you'd like to listen to that and you're a patron, make sure to check out the premium content feed and listen to it there. We're joined this week by Joshua Matthews, a Ph.D. candidate at Northern Illinois University, director of paleontology and vice president of research and operations at the Burpee Museum, and Ann Werda, executive director, also at the Burpee Museum. Thank you both for joining us this week. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. So I guess the biggest thing we have to ask you, of course, is about Jane. <laughs> <laughs> the most complete juvenile <laughs> T-Rex ever recovered. That's right. I notice uh, it seems like Burpee Museum is Team T-Rex for this, no Nano Tyrannus. That's correct. That is very correct. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess, can you tell us, like, how was Jane discovered? How did it come to your museum? All that good stuff. I'd say it was in 2000. The University of Wisconsin-Madison was actually running a paleontology crews out to southeastern Montana, mostly graduate and undergraduate student-led. And they had contacted the former curator of earth sciences here, Michael Henderson, and basically said, you know, 
you guys should really come out to Montana with us. It's a it's a small enough operation. And there's a lot of land that needs to be prospected. And we think that's something that the Burpee, you know, could pull off. So in 2001, no, no, it was, it was still 2000, actually. Michael Henderson and then uh, my predecessor here at the museum, Scott Williams, went out and they spent a week or so out there with the UW crew, kind of just poking around the hills, hiking, looking for fossils coming out. And essentially at the end of the trip, they decided, yeah, this is this is probably something the Burpee could undertake. So in 2001, we basically started what we call our Highway to Hell Creek program. <laughs> basically, people from Rockford can join, you know, follow the team out, follow, be part of the crew, go out and hike around and again, just kind of poke around and see if we can get lucky and find anything. So in 2001, that was the first the first year that we went out. And again, I think entirely people from the Rockford area went out and spent a couple weeks out there hiking around. And, you know, you find if, if you've ever been in the Hell Creek Formation out west or the Lance Formation in Wyoming, you find bone float typically all the time. Little chunks of bone may, might not be able to identify it. Chances of finding where it was coming out of the hill is <laughs> very small. However, um, you get lucky. And it was towards the end of that expedition where uh, a Ph.D. professor Bill Harrison and a local Rockford resident, Carol Tuck, found some toe bones eroding out one of the hills. And they they took them and they showed them to Michael and Scott. And it was quite clear that they belonged to a theropod dinosaur, smaller, um, but definitely wasn't a, a large T-Rex by any means. But they knew it was important. So uh, they started digging into the hill and they they began finding more. Of course, this is always the end of a trip when it happens. So they... <laughs> wrapped it up and they went back out in 2002 and that's kind of when the main excavation occurred and it wasn't long till we realized that there's <laughs> there's a skeleton of a, a good sized theropod dinosaur here and definitely tyrannosaur based on its size we we believed it to be nano tyrannus um, at the time and what was more important about that it was the skeleton of a nano tyrannus up until this point all we had was a skull the night the the Cleveland skull that was found in 1942, not far from Jane, but now we had a skeleton. So it became all that more important. So this kind of was the beginning of the vertebrate paleontology program here at Burpee. So they actually got everything out in 2002. We had large uh, excavators from uh, Ekalaka come out and remove overburden from the site because we had, there was quite a bit above the bone bed. So we brought heavy machinery out, took a good chunk of that hill out to get down to the bone bed. And then, you know, 20,000 pounds later, <laughs> we got, you know, chunks of rock here back in the, in the small burpee lab. Again, at the time, our, our, our lab was pretty tiny here. Mm -hmm. An article I read, uh, the quote called you the little museum that could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, you know, this was, again, we weren't anticipating this. This was the first expedition we ever did. And we weren't expecting quite a find like this so we realized what we had was incredibly important to the museum and potentially to science we weren't trained in fossil preparation we weren't really ready for this so basically we partnered up with a field museum in chicago a lot of them jim holstein connie van b kikiko shinya they all came out and basically taught our staff how to do fossil preparation how to clean up these dinosaur bones and extract them from the rock Unfortunately, I came in a couple of years after Jane was found, so I wasn't part of the, the preparation process. However, um, I got to see the tail end. They were pretty much finishing up prep work by the time I got here. However, it became clear real quick once we started finding skull material in these blocks that um, we had an important specimen. And then pretty much from that point, you know, what we would consider the rock stars of paleontology, you know, Tom Holtz and Tom Carr and Phil Curry and Jack Horner and Paul Serino kind of descended upon our, our you know, smaller mid-sized museum to have a look at this specimen. And I, we had colleagues in like Korea who heard this on the news in Korea were like, why is the Burpee Museum on a, a news channel in Korea? So <laughs> he threw us into the spotlight real quick and she drew a, a lot of attention in terms of uh, what her taxonomic status was, whether this represents a, a nearly complete skeleton of a nano tyrannus or is it something different so that was kind of how we found her and how we ended up with her and it just you know we've had luck beyond jane ever since that's amazing 
uh, and also the fact that it started with toe bones it's kind of like the ideal start with toe bones and then bam something <laughs> like what 50 percent of the skeleton yep. <laughs> and, and a majority of the skull we're missing the brain case and 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 a few other bones but i mean other than that she's pretty beautiful uh, we got representatives of you know all your know, appendicular the hips legs do have a we have a humerus so some form or arm material and then, of course, lots of vertebrae and ribs. Yeah, even a humerus for a T Rex is super rare or yeah, to find. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So that's a, an important one. Yeah. And then we we actually followed that up with a, another tyrannosaur a few years later, which we have another humerus for that as well, which was Petey, which is uh, actually a few years older than Jane. So, but another another sub adult young one. So that's amazing. Yeah. I think Thomas Carr recently said that there are maybe 12 juvenile t-rex known anywhere to science and you've got two of them <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty good for uh you know rockford illinois <laughs> you know, far far from any actual dinosaur bearing units <laughs> yeah that's awesome although we get one in missouri now but yeah mm-hmm. true <laughs> yeah it, it's it's really interesting i almost always forget that jane is not like the holotype of nanotyrannus because every time i think nanotyrannus i think jane but yeah technically there was that earlier one in cleveland yeah. which is the official nanotyrannus if you consider nanotyrannus to be valid yeah. right the skull well, right right i mean and it's it is a beautiful skull we have a cast here in the museum but i haven't set eyes on the actual specimen myself so i gotta gotta get out to cleveland at some point and take a look at that so just just so i can say i've seen it yeah so, and, and that was kind of one of the things that in, in terms of the whether the whether it's nano tyrannus or juvenile tyrannosaurus rex i mean i think the evidence in papers that have come out in the past and then recently holly woodward and colleagues papers is that regardless of whether nano tyrannus you know is valid this this jane and the cleveland specimen are the same thing mm-hmm. and you know now that we have the skeleton of jane we've done the histology and some could argue if they wanted okay maybe Maybe it's not a Tyrannosaurus rex. Maybe it's a different species of Tyrannosaur. But we do know it's a young animal. It's skeletally mature. It's it's rapidly growing. It's in that growth spurt. Very similar to humans. You know, we hit about 11, 12, 13 years and we shoot up and <laughs> plateau out around 20. T-Rex had that same growth trajectory. So, And Jane is pretty much at the base of that, getting ready to shoot up. So even if she's not a Tyrannosaurus rex... You know, by default, the 88 paper that described Nano Tyrannus described it as an adult animal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the nano. <laughs> yeah, the nano. Yes, the nano is an adult animal. And clearly by using Jane as a proxy, it, it, it can't be an adult animal. But here's the thing. Regardless, if she's a Nano Tyrannus, if she's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, we either have the, the most complete juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex or the most complete Nano Tyrannus. Yeah, so, it's the win-win. You know, <laughs> win-win to the museum so and 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 to be honest with you i don't care one or the other but the evidence so far to this point suggests a juvenile tyrannosaurus rex is Petey much bigger than jane then since Petey's a little bit older uh not much to be honest with it a little bit but we don't have nearly what we had for jane she's Petey's really incomplete actually we have a leg basically a lot of foot bones tibia femur uh scapula several large claws and some vertebrae. So it's, she's, you know, Petey's far, far less complete. However, we have the appropriate bones that we can, that we need to do histological analysis. So that was the important part there. Hmm. And, you know, a lot of the, the nano tyrannus pro nano tyrannus big things is the claws because the Petey specimen has massive claws, which wow. are larger than Sue's actually. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Is that, those are hand claws, right? Well, hand claws. Yeah. Yep. We got, that we got a thumb claw, the first digit from each, and then the, the second digit from one one of the arms. So we got three large claws from the site. That's a good, I mean, it's a very good point because you don't see animals with shrinking claws as they get yeah. larger. Mm-hmm. Right. But what's interesting with dinosaurs, I mean, we're noticing like with ceratopsians and pachycephalosaurs is as they get older, some of these, you know, at least the skull, bones of the skull do begin resorbing, do get smaller. Yeah. Like a pachycephalosaurus, you got Stygimolac or or Draco Rex that have these large spikes out of the back of the skull. And then you get into the adult Pachycephalosaur and they're rounded nubs. Yeah. Now, again, whether that has anything to do with it or not, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I, I can't 
uh, you know, really say too much on that, but it's, you know, dinosaurs do weird things we're finding out. So, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I'm glad you clarified that because we talked to actually we saw Pete Larson at an SVP a few years ago and he pulled mm-hmm. out a replica. It must have been of Petey's. It was definitely Petey. Yeah, yeah. Of the claw and was like, this is a yeah. nanotyrannus claw. Here's a T-Rex <laughs> claw. Look how much bigger <laughs> yeah. this is. Pete is a good friend of the museum. And <laughs> every time I see him, you know, he, we have just a little friendly back and forth. And he always tells me I have the most complete nanotyrannus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. he's the most vocal nanotyrannus. Oh, supporter. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and, and and Bacher to extent, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I remember somebody else told us that there weren't any nano tyrannus or any yeah, nano tyrannus claws described, but they I they might be saying on a technicality that the holotype nano tyrannus yeah. doesn't have claws yeah. associated with Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's hard to say without any more of the skeleton, so especially a skull. I guess right now you need the skull to <laughs> if a nano tyrannus is valid, you need the skull to <laughs> The distinguish between the two preserved with the claws. Mm-hmm. <laughs> true, true, true. It's another case and need more fossils. Yep, always. Yep, exactly. exactly. Get out there and find more. How did Jane and Petey get their names? Well, so for, for Petey Jane, said named after a squirrel. Uh, I yep, believe. yep, yep. So, <laughs> what? Uh, what? Yeah. Jane. So Jane got her name from a museum benefactor. So the museum, as it's known right now, is referred to as the Solemn Wing. Prior to ninety nine. The Burpee Museum was in the mansion next door. So it was kind of your old style cabinets of curiosity type museum. One room had taxidermy, one room had fossils, one room had local rocks, and one room had Native American, things of that nature. Um, However, with funds from Robert and Jane Solemn, we built the wing in 1999, and this has become the main, or the museum, the exhibit halls, the collections are all housed here. So when we found Jane, it was, we named it after Jane Solemn. Mm -hmm. So no idea, male or female, but yeah, that's how Jane uh, got the nickname. Now, Petey, when we were out in 2006 hiking around the Badlands in Carter County, one of our volunteers who was out there with us, Darren Breeze, was walking along with Scott Williams, and I don't know if he kicked it or if he just reached <laughs> down and saw it, but there was a chunk of bone laying on the at the base of one of these buttes, and he picks it up, and he just made the comment that it looked like a ham bone. <laughs> and, jokingly and then scott had a look at it and he's like this is part of a tibia and i think it's tyrannosaur so we kind of followed you know bone chunks up the hill and surprisingly we actually found where it was coming out of the hill and dug in and found it but you know since darren found it usually that's the kind of the way it is the person who finds a specimen usually gets to give it a nickname if it's if it warrants a nickname and he and his and his wife amy had a pet squirrel <laughs> uh, squirrel's name was Petey, so he decided to name the T Rex Petey after their pet squirrel. Amazing! <laughs> yeah. uh, and Petey, they had these. You know, Petey was a, a cool, a cool little squirrel. They had video, a video of it in the house, and, and sadly, Petey passed away not too long ago. However, they have another adopted one. But yeah, that's how that's how Petey and Jane got their names. So Petey the squirrel has quite the legacy, right? <laughs> Tell me about it. Might be the most famous squirrel of all time. <laughs> yeah, <hit> that Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> we have a listener question, which is, what is the biggest goal for the museum currently? Or alternatively, what does the museum wish to get done that will potentially be very impactful? Well, the museum has had a tough run as of late. You know, COVID for all nonprofits has been financial challenges, getting people through the door, getting programming to return to its normal numbers. And we're seeing a bit of a rebound. But I think, you know, first and foremost is weathering the storm and getting through. But I think on a more optimistic and exciting piece (laughs) is the fact that we're continuing to grow our science and research collections and research department. And we have a bequest that allows us to do some work here in the labs. And um, that's going to be redoing both the biology lab and the paleontology lab. The biology lab really is just a small, quaint little place to do some taxidermy work, but doesn't really have much in terms of modern equipment, dissection tables, good plumbing to do that nice, gross stuff that <laughs> is, is part of the squishies. Yeah. So, and that's 
you know, one of the things that I enjoy working on a lot. So I end up doing it in my kitchen, which is probably not. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, we're going to, we're going to be psyched to get that part up and running. And the windows are now open. So the public can have conversations with the scientists like they do in the paleo lab, but on the paleo end of it, you know, especially because of the work that we're doing in, Utah, these large sauropod dinosaurs just take up an awful lot of space. And <laughs> yeah. the paleontology lab is designed from an architectural standpoint beautifully. However, you know, the the offices are kind of on an angle and it looks really cool, but it really limits the move around space. It limits the places where we can put big jackets. It limits the number of volunteers that can be in here. And with the great program that Josh is leading, you know, he needs the space to have lots of volunteers, giant dinosaur bones here. And so we're going to knock those offices out, put them elsewhere and really open up that space to get that big paleontology work done. So I think that's going to really drive a lot of what we're able to do here in the lab and also then connect to what we're able to do in the field, both in the biological sciences or in, and in paleogeo. So I think that's really next on our docket and the most exciting thing we've got coming. So I, I'm thrilled to be a part of bringing that to that next level here with Josh Matthews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds huge. Mm-hmm. Is uh, there any hint at what sauropod you're making room for? Well, so are, are you familiar with our Hanksville burpee dinosaur, quarry? I don't think so. Mm-mm. Okay, well, so in Hanksville, Hanksville's in southern Utah. It's the Morrison Formation, so Dra- Jurassic Age, latest Jurassic. When I talk about our Highway to Hell Creek program, so the way we used to run it is we'd go out to Montana, Ecolac, Montana, mid-May to mid-June come back to Rockford for a month, and then go back out mid-July to mid-August. However, in May for several of those years, we got a lot of weather, a lot of bad weather, rain. And if anybody's ever driven in any of these dirt roads out west, when it gets wet, it turns to axle grease and you can't drive on them. Mm. I mean, if you do, you tear them up, you make ruts, and you really uh, tick off the local ranchers. So. (laughs) Uh, you don't want to do that. So it just got to one point where we had a group out there in 2006, I think six or seven. And for that whole week they were out there, we got in the, in the field for half a day. Mm-hmm. So we basically decided maybe we should, you know, look elsewhere. Again, my predecessor always wanted to find a sauropod dinosaur. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the first sessions in May of 2007, he, I, Michael Henderson and a, and a small crew went down to Hanksville, Utah through a number of paleontologists, we were put in touch with Jim Kirkland, who's a state paleontologist at Utah, mm-hmm. and he pointed us in the direction of Hanksville. And Hanksville is surrounded by beautiful exposures of Morrison formation and no institutions were working down there at all. Nobody. And we found out pretty quickly that's because most places don't want to work on sauropod dinosaurs because they're huge. Oh. Um, a lot of space and he a lot of money. But nonetheless, we went down there and we kind of anticipated to be, you know, similar to the Hell Creek Formation. I mean, Morrison Formation is one of those units that has, you know, been studied for a long time. And it's one of the most fossiliferous dinosaur bearing units in the world. So uh, we went down and we didn't have much luck right away finding anything. Usually we expected float little pieces of bones and we didn't. So on one of the days we went into the local Bureau of Land Management office and we started talking to the geologist and we basically said, you know, we're from Illinois. We're looking for dinosaurs. Uh, any idea? And Buzz Rocco was the geologist down there. And he he basically, with this kind of cowboy draw, cowboy hat, you know, says, well, rock hounds have been telling us about bones coming out of the old cow dung reservoir for about 20 years. <laughs> and nobody's ever gone out to take a look at it. He's like, I suppose I could take you out there. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that sounds great. So, he took us out and the following day and, you know, it's it's about, as a crow flies, it's about eight miles off the road, but it's a winding road through all this beautiful, picturesque, Mars-like landscape. And we get to the, the site. What's cool is you look at the ground and it's, it's, it's sandstone units and it looks like there's all this black rocks covering the ground. Although when you bend down to start looking at it closer, it's all busted up dinosaur bone. Wow. It's just eroding out. So... That was a good sign. And yeah. then we poked around. We did find a few bones coming out. So we, you know, dug around a little bit, basically decided it's worth re-exploring or coming back the next summer to open up, you know, a dig. So in 2008, we partnered with 
Dr. Matt Bonin is a sauropod paleontologist. He was he was at Western Illinois University at the time. And then one of our board members, Steve Simpson, is a geologist. He brought students from a community college, Highland Community College in Freeport, Illinois, out. And, you know, we just started working in the area. And it wasn't long before each student or each group of students were working on bones. We were finding them coming out all over, some of them big, some of them small. Some of them pretty beat up because you're right at that weathered surface. And then Brian Sutter, who was a, he's actually a, a police officer who was taking the, the class. He wandered up to a hill nearby and found two huge femora, sauropod femurs coming out of the ground. Nice. And then soon after that, you had students started, you know, sneaking up to that hill. And <laughs> within the first week, the whole site just exploded. I think I had over a hundred bones mapped in that wow. first week. And it's just, it's bone on top of bone on top of bone. As of now, we got at least 20 dinosaurs in this quarry. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Mostly sauropods. And just to give a little perspective, like yeah. when he's talking about this quarry, it's not like you have to hike from one end of the quarry to the <laughs> yeah. other. You can almost shout across yeah, the space yeah. in which they're working. Yeah. yeah. It's wow. The size of a football field right now, somewhere around there, maybe not even that big probably, but, uh, it's just, it's a jack straw bones. It's, it's, when I say 20, I mean, you know, we can base that off of species or number of, you know, say left shoulder blades, you mm-hmm. know, we have, you know, five left shoulder blades to a diplodic or something like that. So it's probably likely far more than that, but we have for right, as of right now, I think we're at eight species. We have Camarasaurus. We have several Camarasaurus, lots of Diplodocus, Apatosaurus. Maybe Barosaurus. We don't know quite on, on that one yet. That one will take more. Allosaurus. We have Stegosaurus. We have Dryosaurus. We have Nanosaurus. And we have a, a rare armored dinosaur called Mimora Pelta. Hmm. Wow. I see why you need all that space now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I guess, fortunately, these bones, they're sauropod bones, but the sauropods aren't adults either because... Mm-hmm. Burpee can't find adult dinosaurs. We're like, <laughs> dinosaurs. I was gonna say, your, your specialty is the juveniles, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, our dino nursery. So, <laughs> although some of these, I mean, they're still, you know, these one femur is, you know, five feet long, still big, but an adult can be, you know, six, seven, eight feet in some cases. So, some of these dinosaurs, but they're just huge. So, that quarry, we've been working there since about 2007. So, every summer we go back out and we bring more bones back. And so, these are the, you know, again, when Ann was, talking about expanding the lab that's why i mean we got some huge jackets to bring in and the way the lab is configured right now around my office and my lab manager's office it just doesn't make sense Hmm. to have these here so the goal is to rip the offices out expand this area so we can you know work on these the bones and more volunteers we got a lot of volunteers who want to work but now with covid restrictions i don't you know i don't want a ton of people in the small space right now yeah, um, yeah, makes open sense. it up and then get more people in here to work and, and clean these bones up because we have a lot. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So Paleo Fest, this is an annual event, right? It's every spring. Can anybody go? Yes, yes. So Paleo Fest, this will be our 24th year doing Paleo Fest. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. It's We kind of started on a whim in 1999 or 98, 99, and it was only a handful of people at that time. And it's over a Saturday and Sunday. And at that time, you would buy tickets for individual talks. However, it was around 2012 or 2013, I want to say, where we kind of went to more of a symposium style. And it's it's essentially a mini SVP. It's actually a lot of fun. I mean, we, you know, it's interdisciplinary, so it's not just dinosaurs. So this year, they typically now we're up to about 16 speakers over the weekend, plus a keynote speaker Saturday night where we have a special dinner that we host. Last year, we did it virtually which was kind of tricky. It worked out, but there was, you know, definitely a learning curve to that. As of now, we're monitoring the COVID situation. We're planning for an in-person event. It will be March 4th through the 6th of 2022. We're we're keeping our fingers crossed, but we're hoping to get back to the in-person event. But yeah, it's it's, it's a really cool event. We have the, the talks from all the paleontologists. We also have workshops for kids. We have stations all across the museum where, you know, kids can come in and we have what we call a paleo passport. Typically each station is reflects one of the speaker's talks. So, you know, maybe it will be a crocodile station or a, you know, a 
Theropod station or a Moses or whatever, depending on what those speakers are that year. And kids can come in, they can do a little activity and get their passport stamped. And once they get all the, all the stations stamped, they get a little prize at the end, things of that nature. And then we really reach out to schools as well. So on, on the Friday event, we, we started doing uh, school groups, bringing school groups into the, the museum. And then we'll have a panel of the speakers that the students can just ask questions and, and chat one-on-one with the paleontologist. So it was, it was last year, of course, you know, and this year might be virtually as well, that component, but it, it's a great way to reach out to the local communities and get kids involved and students, you know, asking the questions. And I think one of the cool things about Paleo Fest is the fact that anybody can talk to these paleontologists. You know, I remember when I was a kid, Jack Horner was my hero. I mean, he, him, it was Jack Horner, Bob Bakker and, and Paul Serino, but Jack Horner was, he was my hero. I, I looked it's a up T-Rex one. <laughs> <laughs> and now it, it's just surreal to sit at a bar and have a beer with him. Yeah. You know, he's a friend, you know, I mean, I remember sitting in the Detroit airport one year on my way to SVP and I hear, hello, young man. <laughs> Jack walks up and sits down and just starts chatting. I mean, like this, it's, it's a cool, you know, I think as kids, when we, you see these people on TV, you know, you like idolize them and you think, oh, I would, you know, never get a chance to talk to this person, but you can, <laughs> they're all, they're all just regular normal people. So yeah. I'm the paleo fest and you get these kids that, and kids have, I mean, they, they know their stuff. <laughs> it, it's incredible. The, the kind of questions that these kids come up with at paleo fest or they know what they're talking about. So they, they can ask the hard questions to these paleontologists and it's kind of fun to see them squirm a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when, you know, the nano tyrannus comes into play or some mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. So definitely. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a fun event. And it's to the point where even the, the like I said, the speakers, you know, they, they, they like coming just because it's like a mini, mini SVP, super mini SVP, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I think fossils are, are the, the gateway to science. So, I mean, most kids love dinosaurs and fossils. They may not be paleontologists, but you know what? They might they might go into physics. They might be a chemist. They might become a doctor. Who who knows? But I think it's a a good way to hook them and show them that you know science is fun. Science is actually really fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah dinosaurs are a great lead into yeah. science for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know yeah. you've got a ceratopsian skull wall too, right? We do. We do. So. So we have the Jane exhibit. Sorry, I kind of segued here. So the Jane exhibit was put up in 2005, and that was pretty much to showcase her because Jane is so important. And then my first expedition in 2005, because we put the Jane exhibit up in June of 2005, the end of June, we actually didn't plan on doing a dig in Montana that summer just because the effort that needed to go into this exhibit. So uh, we put up the exhibit, and it was probably a week later, and basically Scott got the itch to go back out. He's like, I don't want to. <laughs> So he's like, let's just a small crew go out, spend a few days out there and see what we can, you know, find. So we did. And Stephen Brusati and Thomas Carr was out on that day. It's the first time I met those two. And a local architect here, Helmut Redschlag, came out with us with uh, some friends, Marine and Velta. And we were all just prospecting, hiking around. We had a couple sites that we went to. So this was, again, my first dinosaur expedition i was just completely jazzed because you know i didn't think i'd ever actually do this <laughs> but i was out on it and then of course again like always happens the end of the trip a local architect helmet found a, a bone poking out of the hill we went over and it was a triceratops femur um and we dug in a little more we found a vertebrae part of a shoulder blade some ribs and got what we could out winterized it for the season and we came back in 2006 and that's when that site uh kind of exploded so we found what it's the first Triceratops bone bed that's been described. We had three Triceratops buried in this one unit. Wow. Yep. The most complete one referred to as Homer. That's another juvenile. It, it is it. It is. It's a subadult, <laughs> subadult Triceratops. And so Homer's the most complete. It's not named after the epic poet Homer. It's named after Homer Simpson. <laughs> that was favorite cartoons. And then we have the smaller skull in there, which we refer to kind of as Bart. Not really, but kind of. <laughs> which is a less complete. And then the third, the third specimen is literally only represented by one bone, the left nasal, which is, we already had a left nasal for the other two skulls. Mm. So it was, you know, a third one anyway. So this actually became the focus of my master's thesis. I, I, I wrote that site up for my master's, that skeleton up. 
And then we put it on exhibit in 2013. And that was kind of the reason we did the Homer exhibit is we wanted to showcase more of the Hell Creek. So the Jane site or the Jane exhibit kind of really focuses on her and the, you know, the, the histology and um, some pathologies. However, we you go into Homer's room, it's representatives of the Hell Creek formation. We got a pachycephalosaur. We got, of course, the triceratops. We got microvertebrates specimens on the wall. And then we got a growth series of triceratops from a little baby skull to an adult skull. Aww. And then we also wanted to bring in the wall of ceratopsian skulls, which we would like to say we thought of first. But that was actually, if, if you've been out to the Utah Museum, mm-hmm. map, they have a huge wall. And it was just, it's incredibly impressive just to see all these huge ceratopsian skulls on the wall. So we kind of made a smaller version of that. So we have, I think, eight or nine skulls up on the wall right now of uh, ceratopsians just to show the diversity in the ceratopsians themselves because they're just, they got these bizarre spikes and horns yeah. mm-hmm. and, and they're just, that's the ceratopsians are my favorite of, of all the dinosaurs just because they're so bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> they are awesome. So we have one last question, which is, where's the best place to find more about the Burpee Museum? Burpee.org. If you go there, we have information about our educational program, about our exhibits. Um, There should be a tab for our expeditions. So yeah, it's Burpee.org. Go there, search around, peruse the site. You can see some of our exhibits. We, you know, the silver lining, I guess, of COVID is that it allowed us to basically digitally scan the museum. So we, Mm -hmm. we have what's called a Matterport camera, which they actually are used for the real estate industry you go to scan you know houses so you can walk through a house on your computer however we did that with a museum so oh, we nice scan the museum and you can do a, a virtual tour a lot of that was for educational programming so i'm not ex- i'm not certain if all of that's online at the moment but yeah just go check it out and, and then if you like it come visit us awesome yeah, yeah we got to make it out there definitely yeah absolutely thank you so much ann and joshua that was Great hearing more about Jane and the museum and, of course, PaleoFest, which is coming up. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Volchimeria, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Volchimeria was a eusauropod that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Patagonia, Argentina, in the Canyon Don Asfalto Formation. It looks like other sauropods. It's got the long neck and tail and a stocky body, and it walked on all fours. It also had low, flat neural spines. It's estimated to be 29 and a half feet or 9 meters long. and uh, it, short. Yeah. It weighed about the same as a rhinoceros. That doesn't make it seem that small. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the heaviest animals on Earth today, and I'm thinking about it as this tiny thing. That's because you're just comparing it to other sauropods, you yeah. know? It was herbivorous, too. Not surprising. It's a sauropod. The type and only species is Volchimeria chubitensis. It was described in 1979 by Jose Bonaparte, and the genus name means of Volchimere. It's named after Wolfgang Volchimere, a geologist and paleontologist. I'm guessing it's chubutensis because it's from Chubut in Argentina. Probably. Now, the fossils found include a mostly complete pelvis and sacrum, caudal vertebrae, femur, and tibia. So we're talking pretty much the hips, leg part of the leg below the hips, and a little bit of the tail connected to the hip. Yeah. Volchimeria was found close to Piatnitskisaurus and Patagosaurus, and the ilium, the part of the hip of Volchimeria, was much shorter than that of Patagosaurus. In 2017, a study by Ignacio Alejandro Cerda and others looked at the growth rates in sauropods and, based on histology, found Volchimeria had rapid, sustained growth rates. Hmm. There were these closely spaced growth marks. Makes sense. It goes with its relatively small size. It grew fast, and then it was done. (laughs) Mm, Gotcha. So it had, like, sort of a similar growth trajectory of a bigger sauropod, but then just stopped without getting too big. I don't know if it was the same trajectory because you've got the closely spaced growth marks, Mm. but it all happened quickly. Some other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include the sauropod, Patagosaurus, and the megalosauroids, Condoraptor, and Piatnitskisaurus. And our fun fact of the day is that contrary to popular belief, penguins aren't found at the North or South Pole. 
Where are they found? <laughs> well, so they aren't found in the northern hemisphere at all, basically. Mm-hmm. So they are found in some zoos, technically, in the northern hemisphere. And they're also found in a couple of islands that are barely north of the equator. But in general, penguins are purely a south hemisphere creature. The reason they're not found at the South Pole is that penguins have to fish and they also can't fly, which means that you don't really find them inland very far. Oh, and the pole is inland. Yes. So they're found in the southern Antarctic, right, in the Antarctic Circle. Mm -hmm. But the South Pole is actually on land. So Antarctica is a landmass. It's a continent, just like the other six continents. It just happens to be covered in ice. And the South Pole is actually about 1,300 kilometers or 810 miles from the nearest water. Hmm. It would be closer if the Ross ice shelf wasn't in the way, <laughs> if it was, because that part actually is frozen water. Mm-hmm. But the South Pole, the geographical South Pole, is on Antarctica, like above land. So no matter what, it would be hundreds of miles from the water. So even if it wasn't covered in ice, you probably wouldn't find penguins there because it's just too far from the water. And why would they want to go that far inland? And by the way, there are multiple South Poles, but I'm talking about the geographic South Pole. It's the one that almost everybody means when they say the South Pole. It's 90 degrees south on the map. It's the point that the Earth spins around. So that's there is magnetic south pole there's also the geomagnetic south pole and other south poles you can come up with (laughs) all (laughs) right just in case anybody's curious (laughs) the geographic south pole is also over 2.8 kilometers or 9,300 feet above sea level (laughs) which is really high i mean Mm -hmm. it's higher than most places on earth by far And it would be quite a trek for a flightless bird to go up almost two miles in height. Oh, goodness. When they have to go to the sea in order to get food. The average temperature at the South Pole is negative 50 degrees Celsius or negative 57 Fahrenheit. That's not just the average in the winter. That's the average year round. The record low there is negative 83 degrees Celsius or negative 117 Fahrenheit. Ugh. I don't even know if penguins could survive in that cold. That's incredibly cold. Yes. It's certainly warmer when you're closer to the Antarctic Ocean. I'm cold just thinking about it. Yes, it is very cold. Colder temperatures have been recorded further inland in Antarctica because the South Pole actually isn't that close to the edge. You can get significantly more landlocked in Antarctica than the South Pole. It's not centered. The South Pole isn't centered on Antarctica. That's how I always imagined it as a kid. And that's kind of how it looks on a map. Like the South Pole is right in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually pretty far off to the side. Hmm. And if it wasn't for that ice shelf, like I said, it would not really be that far inland at all. The record high at the South Pole is negative 12 degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. In all the decades it's been recorded, it's never even come close to anything melting. The South Pole does occasionally get dinosaur visitors, however. Okay. They just aren't penguins. Occasionally, and by occasionally, I mean pretty regularly, most seasons even, skuas reportedly visit. What? And I think Matt LaManna, in our interview with him way back when... He described skuas in Antarctica as a cross between a hawk and a gull and that they're very aggressive to people Mm -hmm. and kind of monster birds. They have to be to survive those temperatures. (laughs) It is very harsh to live in the Antarctic. The skuas that reach the South Pole probably get blown off course during mating season. That's usually when they find them in December, basically in the middle of their summer. Although other Antarctic birds have reportedly been seen I just couldn't verify it with anything. The only one I could verify was the skua because I found some photos of it. And actually, there were researchers taking pictures of the skua. And you can tell in the picture, it looks like it's attacking a flag. (laughs) And their description was that it was trying to eat one of their orange flags that was out on the ice. Could it digest a flag? No. I think it was probably very hungry because it had to fly hundreds of miles from any even remotely nearby food source. And it saw something orange and thought, maybe that's food. Yeah, I think so. My fun fact was originally going to be that the only living creatures at the South Pole are humans and dinosaurs, which I think is true, (laughs) because I think it's just the occasional dinosaur plus people that hang out there. And a lot of places do say there are no living things at the South Pole because it's just so cold. There's no soil there. There's no sunlight for half of the year. And, you know, there's no ocean water or anything. So Mm -hmm. it's 
pretty much the most inhospitable place on all of Earth. It would be the inland part of Antarctica. I was thinking of the people as dinosaur visitors in the sense that they're visiting the dinosaurs that yeah. live there. It's really the dinosaurs that visit them for once yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because they're rarely actually at the South Pole. But I should mention dinosaurs have been found very close to the South Pole, actually. Glacialosaurus and Cryolophosaurus were found at around 84 degrees south, which is obviously very close to 90 degrees south. Mm -hmm. It's just a few hundred miles from the South Pole. It was much warmer then, though. Yes. And it may not have been. I, don't, I couldn't find exactly what the paleo latitude was for them. But you did cover Cryolophosaurus in episode 68 and Glacialosaurus in episode 168. I don't think there was a reason that they were exactly 100 apart. <laughs> no, it's a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, but pretty interesting. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you're not already part of our community, consider joining patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.